Welcome to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. This is Father Peter Mangum. I just discovered a new series on DVD, a study program from the Augustan Institute that presents a specifically Catholic worldview that addresses the Protestant Reformation by means of the lives of six saints. This study program is called True Reformers, Men and Women Who Spearheaded the Church's Rebirth After the Turbulence and Confusion Caused by the Protestant Reformation. You may wish to check it out. Back in the early summer when I mapped out this series, I knew I wanted to dedicate an episode after focusing on the reformation of the church that took place as a result of the Council of Trent and take a look at some historical figures who are indeed our true reformers. To restate a concept from last week, we understand that reforming the church must come from within the communion of the church not outside or from individuals or groups separated from it. Examples of such individuals are found in the stories of people like St. Catherine of Siena and St. Charles Borromeo. This week, let's take a closer look at the context for their lives and the great contributions that they made to the church. So this episode number eight, I entitle The True Reformers. I actually deliberately chose these two individuals for this podcast because neither of them were contemporaries of Martin Luther, yet they each represent the spirit of reform that works naturally and organically in the body of Christ from within, working toward the greatest possible unity in the church. Remember that among the four marks of the church found in our Nicene Creed, the first is expressed as unity. St. Catherine of Siena died a hundred years before Martin Luther was even born, in the age when many of the abuses of practice, later noted by Luther, were beginning. She lived during an era known to the church historians as the Babylonian captivity of the church, between 1308 and 1378. Because of complex political conditions in Europe, the papacy was headquartered in Avignon, France, and not in Rome. As a result of pressure applied by the French monarchy and a state of war between France and England, the church suffered from political manipulation. And in the 14th century, corruption within the highest levels of the church was at a peak. St. Catherine of Siena was known during her lifetime as a devout mystic, and she received the gift of a stigmata, bearing the wounds of Christ as a young woman. Her calling was one of reform. As she looked about her and saw the ravages of civil war in her home of Italy and the loss of the papal presence in Rome, one day while praying at the tomb of St. Peter, she had a vision and literally felt the weight of the church's discord fall upon her shoulders. From that point forward, she dedicated her life to a restoration of unity. She was an ambassador involved in many civil conflicts, and in the process, she made a strong impression on the Pope, Gregory XI. She implored Pope Gregory to return to Rome, citing the instability and lack of peace in Italy as a sign of God's disfavor. He was so moved by her piety and dignity that he left Avignon for Rome in 1377 even over the very strong objections of the French king and the College of Cardinals. Soon after the death of Pope Gregory XI the following year, the church was yet again in turmoil as a papal schism occurred with rival popes in Avignon and Rome. With her health failing, Catherine rallied to the sign of the valid pope, Urban VI, in Rome, and again served the cause of reconciliation until her death less than two years later. She was canonized in 1461 because of her holiness of life and tirelessly striving for the unity of the church, as well as following reports of miracles and her incorrupt remains. St. Catherine's life represents the spirit of true reform, one which seeks to heal from within. Her life of prayer, devotion, and obedience did not deter her from seeking reconciliation in an active way, nor did her disgust at the discord within the papacy itself 
take her away from the church. Although she was not a contemporary of the Protestant movement, one cannot doubt that her tireless advocacy for unity would have been the same. For her life's work, St. Catherine of Siena was named a Doctor of the Church by Pope Blessed Paul VI in 1970. Now let's consider the life of someone who lived on the other side of the Protestant movement, St. Charles Borromeo. He was Archbishop of Milan, as well as a Cardinal of the Church, from 1564 to 1584. During this time, the last session of the Council of Trent had concluded, and there was a great deal of work to be done to make sure that reforms of practice took place. Borromeo took on this responsibility. Milan was perhaps the largest archdiocese in Italy at that time, and historical evidence shows that the clergy and laity had greatly lapsed in their zeal and their knowledge and practice of the faith. The selling of indulgences and church offices was common, and monasteries were quite worldly. Borromeo therefore faced a daunting task with enforcing the reforms of Trent. He was not discouraged. More than any other factor, Borromeo believed that the abuses in the church were the result of ignorance on the part of the clergy, which extended, therefore, to the lay people. He began a rigorous program of seminary education for priests and went from church to church, monastery to monastery, and worked to personally correct abuses wherever he found them. His emphasis on Catholic learning was not just important for his time, but it was the foundation of a model used in Catholic instruction even today. His advice was sought by kings, diplomats, and many leaders in the church. Such was his reputation. After his death in 1584, at the age of 46, popular devotion to him spread rapidly. People remembered him for his humility and his dedication to the reforms demanded by the Council of Trent. He was canonized less than 30 years later, in 1610, by Pope Paul V. The Church remembers both of these individuals, St. Catherine of Siena and St. Charles Borromeo, and many others like them, like St. Thomas More, executed by Henry VIII, and St. Ignatius of Loyola, as well as St. Teresa of Avila, and many others. These are the true Reformers. They all share in common a love for the Church, that could not be displaced by worldly events or even sin and corruption within the church. Responding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, who has guided the church since Pentecost, they became models of an obedient activism, pointing out abuses and dedicating their lives to the church, even in the glare of its sometimes obvious human corruption. I can't help but think back to the 13th century and St. Francis of Assisi's efforts to rebuild Christ's church. My whole point is that all of this was done within the context of the church. What St. Catherine of Siena and St. Charles Borromeo and the others have most in common is that they were able to see the church as visible and yet invisible, earthly and yet eternal, bound in history, but also transcending it, with the eyes of faith, they saw past the human condition to the church's perfect glory and responded to the call before them. Their roles in history, in turn, have inspired countless others. Next week, our podcast series will continue with a look at another positive and important legacy of the era of Protestantism, the great renewal and strengthening of mysticism that came about as a result. Until then, we continue our unceasing prayers for a restoration of unity among all who pray to God our Father as Christ our Savior taught us. The following prayer is the second option for a collect, the opening prayer, of the Mass for Christian Unity. So let us pray. We humbly ask you, Lord, lover of the human family, to pour out more fully upon us the grace of your Spirit, and grant that, walking worthily in the vocation to which you have called us, 
we may bear witness to the truth before others and seek with confidence the unity of all believers in the bond of peace. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Until next week, thanks for listening to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. Amen.